At the 7th Congress of the Canadian Sleep Society held in Toronto in September 2015, several past presidents, founders and former board members met to discuss 30 years of history of the Society. The Canadian Sleep Society, or CSS, was formed in June 1986 by Dr. Roger Broughton as a professional association of clinicians, scientists and technologists to further the advancement and understanding of sleep and its disorders through scientific study and public awareness. The Canadian Sleep Society was incorporated in 1989 and signed by Drs. Roger Broughton, Robert Ogilvie and Carlisle Smith. Hi, uh, it's uh, 2015 and we're at the Canadian Sleep Society meeting. Uh, my name is Brian Murray and uh, I'd like to uh, uh, interview a number of members who've been quite influential over the last 30 years of the Canadian Sleep Society. And so I'd like to start with uh, Roger Broughton uh, and I'd like him to tell us a little bit about uh, the origin of this organization uh, which uh, picked up in 1986. Right. Well, um, I think it's true to say that Canadian sleep clinicians and perhaps particularly Canadian sleep researchers have had a, a very high profile for many years. Uh, and many of the uh, best studies and so forth uh, at the Sleep Research Society meetings were held by Canadians. The, the real thing that triggered the desire of a number of people, not just myself, uh, to create a Canadian society uh, were several. Uh, and I think the most important was that the annual business meetings held by the SR, SRS were taken up almost entirely with American problems and did nothing to help Canadian uh, sleep research or sleep medicine. Uh, in terms of research, the funding bodies were different, and in Canada, the, uh, the health care system, is, as everybody knows, is totally uh, different in organization in all provinces. It's a type of universal health care. Another issue is, is a cultural issue. I, I think uh, Canada is, is truly a bilingual and indeed a multilingual, but primarily a bilingual uh, country. In 1985, uh, I think it was, Bob and I posted a little sign uh, in the, uh, the area of the, the meeting room saying that there would be a special meeting open to anybody uh, to come and discuss the, the possibility and the pros and cons of developing a, a separate Canadian sleep society. We decided on three basic principles and uh, they are uniquely uh, uh, fitted for, for the number of people we have in, in the area. First is that the meetings would be every second year. We didn't feel we had the, the number of people to have enough progress in different projects to meet every year. The second principle was that the uh, presidents would uh, alter between clinicians and scientists, so there will be no domination of one group by one group over the other. And uh, a third of the four was that all persons active in sleep research, circadian research, clinical sleep medicine, or clinical sleep research, or the uh, sleep related industries would be excluded if they wished to become members. So we didn't know whether this, this society would, would really survive, but our growth has been exponential. And it's been absolutely wonderful to see the growth. I think we now have over 700 members, and the meetings have been excellent. I, I think we've had great social impact in that more and more in newspapers and TV shows and so on, you see sleep being a component of, of the program. And I think that the, uh, the scientific, medical, and social aspects of sleep uh, have been increasingly understood by our society 
and by funding agencies, but I still think we're on the way to go. So that was uh, mid 1980s, uh, the genesis of the, the group. Uh, the uh, articles of incorporation were in 1989. Perhaps the three of you could tell us about that. Well said, Roger. I'm Bob Ogilvie, the first vice president for research and the second president of the CSS. Two fundamentals of our society stood out for me for the, from the earliest days. The first was our decision to be unified, to value equally the contributions of Canadian sleep clinicians and sleep researchers. This remains vital to the society, in my opinion. The second is our inclusiveness. The CSS has always embraced the powerful contributions of Francophone and Anglophone members and has recruited members from C to C. Equally important, the Society reached out to and valued the contributions of sleep technicians and sleep students, supporting students to attend conferences and technicians as they formed their own association. From the earliest days, Canadians have contributed much more to the science of sleep and sleep medicine than our numbers would lead others to expect. I see every sign that this will continue with the, with the current membership and executive and wish this generation of sleep uh, researchers and clinicians every success. And oh yes, did you know that the first name of the CSS was the SSC? Over to you, Carlisle, and thank you very much. Um, I'm Carlisle Smith. Uh, I'm a professor emeritus of psychology at Trent University, and I was officially the first uh, Canadian Sleep Society uh, secretary treasurer. And uh, my job, one of my big jobs, was to try and get uh, the Canadian Sleep Society incorporated officially. And so I spent many hours sitting with a lawyer in Peterborough, Ontario. Now, we usually had a, a, a meeting piggybacked on top of the American Sleep Society meetings. All the Canadians went to it, and so we used to just take a hotel room and uh, meet together to form our own society. And uh, I had to leave before it was done, and uh, I had my wife fax it uh, to me while I was there, and it had to be faxed to the lobby of the hotel. So this woman thought I was going to get a couple of pages. There was pages everywhere, a little bit of floor. So anyway, uh, I, in the nick of time, had uh, the whole document ready. I took it into the meeting, and uh, everybody looked at it, seemed to be okay. And then someone said, so how much did this cost? And uh, I said, well, uh, $2,200. And it was complete silence for a little while. And then Harvey Mordowski said, I think you got a real bargain. So I went, that's great. Uh, so that, that part was done. I, I thought I had actually uh, made it and stayed within a reasonable amount of money. And uh, we didn't really have very much money in those days. And so I did all of the accounting work myself just at my desk. And uh, I uh, one time was adding up and I wasn't sure how much money we had, and we wound up with $247 surplus. Wow, that was a great day. Uh, I think the budgets are a little bit bigger now. Okay, uh, Dr. McLean, please tell us about uh, your experience and your, uh, in your time on the CSS and any memorable events. Uh, I'm Alistair McLean at Queen's University. Uh, I became involved in the executive of the CSS in uh, 1990. Since all the hard work had been done, I took over from Carlisle as secretary treasurer at that time. And uh, I received all the doc official documents of the society and the official seal, of which I was very impressed, and impressed the seal on many bits of blank paper for a while until I got used to it. Uh, what I remember about the time as Secretary Treasurer actually is that dominated by trying to get people to pay their subscriptions, <laughs> trying to uh, get enough money for the society to operate. And of course we were trying to move forward at that time on a number of fronts. Uh, we used to have a, an annual dinner at the APSS meetings, as they were then, 
And in spite of the fact that I tried to get people to sign up for this meeting ahead of time, in fact, most people arrived on the door with money in their pocket to pay for the meeting. And I can remember uh, on one occasion, the meeting was in Toronto on one of the waterfront hotels. I was staying for some reason, I think, in the Royal York at the time. And I finished up walking back to the Royal York about midnight through a very dark Toronto with about $500 in loose change in my pocket. <laughs> and uh, the then president, Mark Krieger, uh, came part of the way with me. And for some reason, I thought he was actually going to escort me back to my hotel. But about halfway there, he said, well, good night, you know, have a good time, and sheared off. So I was quite relieved to get to the hotel at that point. Uh, getting subscriptions uh, was not as easy as one might have thought. Um, in fact, I had to done several distinguished members of the society to get them to pay their subscriptions on time. Uh, I, I think at that time, the budget for the society was really quite minuscule, as Carlyle has, has pointed out, and it was really an anxiety every year to see whether we would in fact be able to cover our expenses and do the things that we wanted to. One of my other major memories from that time is uh, we were moving forward on trying to come up with some clinical standards. And I remember a meeting at which Mara Krieger, as president, uh, presented the proposals to the CSS. And I spent the next day dealing with some absolutely furious colleagues who were in private practice and who thought they were going to be edged out. And each one of them started the conversation by saying, I've been on the phone to my lawyer in Toronto, and I want to tell you this, 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 and this. Um, and in about 1993, I think it was, I took over as president from Mara Krieger. And at that point, I was still actually, as president, getting lawyers' letters threatening to sue the society, and me personally, and anybody else who happened to be around at the time. <laughs> and Charlie George was also very much involved at that point as vice president clinical, and, and did a lot of the work in moving those standards forward, which I think were absolutely critical to the level of um, support for clinical sleep studies and for the, our ability to train and standardize training. And I think the success in that respect, and I would go back to uh, what uh, Roger said at the beginning, was the fact that Canadians are, I think, inherently collegial. And although there were some difficult times, we were able to work them through, and I think the state of the society today is an indication of the support we got from sleep clinicians and sleep scientists in Canada. Uh, thank you. Um, and Dr. George, perhaps you'd like to pick up that thread of conversation. Tell us about your time on the CSS and memorable events. Thank you. Um, I'm Charlie George. I'm a respirologist and uh, former sleep researcher. Uh, more than administrator, but I, but I joined the uh, Sleep Society, and I was at that 85 meeting that uh, where there was a vote about should we get together. So I uh, have been active in the society right from the beginning. And as Dr. McLean outlined, I was the vice president of clinical at the time he was the president, and it was my job to carry forward and create the uh, the consensus for standards, which eventually were published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. That was a labor of love, uh, trying to cajole and uh, keep everybody in line, and uh, you know do the Canadian thing, which was compromise. Uh, but we we seemed to shepherd that one through. Uh, I do remember the the uh, concerns about uh, these documents going to limit practice of people. And <clears throat> we did have a few terse uh, encounters with uh, some of the people Alistair alluded to, but uh, there were no blows thrown and uh, everyone left the room with no cuts and bruises. So <laughs> that was quite good. Um, following that, I took over the helm of the society and it was at that time we tried to, I tried personally to increase the membership one of the things that's been difficult over the years is to engage, uh, get good engagement from uh, my respirology colleagues. I think uh, in later years they're now starting to, to see the benefits, but there's unfortunately has been quite a uh, separation between the Canadian Sleep Society and the Canadian Thoracic Society, and having been a member of both, uh, I worked hard to try to get them uh, you know, in the tent rather than outside the tent. Uh, that's still a work in progress. 
I worked hard, I think, at that time to get the uh, membership up and get some sponsorship so that the budget wasn't quite uh, $237 to the good. <clears throat> I can't remember exactly how many we were to the good, but it was, uh, it still was kind of a, uh, an ad hoc, um, sort of shoestring arrangement and who was going to do the books, who was going to be the, the treasurer. Uh, I, I got the, one of the techs in my lab to be the treasurer and so I had to make sure she was a member of the society in order to do that and it was a lot of fun. Um, and Dr. DeConnick, please uh, tell us about your time on the CSS, uh, when that was and uh, memorable events. I'm Joseph de Koning. I have been uh, involved, uh, at the, I'm at the University of Ottawa in psychology. Um, I've been involved in sleep and dream research since uh, 1972, 73, when I joined in Ottawa and met uh, Roger, who was uh, very, uh, very active and uh, who initiated this uh, cooperation within the Ottawa area of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity and this uh, is uh, now living very well within the Canadian Sleep Society. So I follow the evolution of the American associations, the uh, European, and uh, I follow up every step of uh, the development of CSS. And every year, progress was made. And in, when, by the time I became uh, president, I had been very much involved in university administration, and I decided to use that to get this following step going, which was to organize a full-blown meeting uh, like we have now, uh, and that involved technicians and, uh, and every, everybody as uh, students. And we also had at the time Sleep Wake Disorders Canada. That was a fairly big organization that had a secretariat in, uh, on Young Street here in Toronto and uh, worked very uh, hard with them and uh, they participated in the organization of this meet of that meeting so we had about 300 participants but half of them were sleep wake disorders people who were uh, patient patients and uh, uh, people in the community so uh it worked and uh it, it was quite a challenge because a lot of, a lot of people said it's not going to work it's too tough we're too small and uh, too spread out and we finally did get, we had about 125, you know, researchers and, and clinicians and, uh, in there out of the 300. So it worked out and we lost a little bit of money, but I was dean of graduate studies at the University of Ottawa and it was easy to get, you know, pitch in to uh, $237 or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's it, so I'm, I'm very proud of that. And what I really uh, like about what's going on in the CSS again is as of, as a champion of interdisciplinarity. I think we're keeping that. Uh, Roger was very uh, adamant about it, and I am uh, too, so that we have everybody interested in sleep together and not get this uh, separation, and your work uh, is very appreciated on that too. So uh, I'm, very, I'm very proud of what's been done and very proud of what's, uh, uh, you know, the future. So let's go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Moran, uh, can you tell us about uh, what time you were on the uh, board and, and uh, memorable moments from that period? Yes, hi, I'm Charles Moran from uh, Laval University in Quebec City. And uh, I guess uh, Joseph introduced me uh, mostly to CSS and to the board. Uh, it was in 2002 or three, and uh, I had been involved in some uh, board activities in the U.S., having lived there for 12 years, and uh, I think that I was a little bit scared initially, not knowing what I was getting into, because uh, my prior experience had not always been that uh, easy, uh, uh, trying to bring together researchers and clinicians from different disciplines, uh, but it, it turned out to be a great experience uh, when I was president, and certainly that uh, my memorable experience was the meeting in Quebec City that we had, uh, and uh, also having so many of my team uh, involved in organizing the meeting. I think that was a, a lot of fun. Uh, to have uh, so many people uh, involved, not only in organizing the meeting, but also in taking over the administration uh, of CSS at Laval from Sleep Wake Disorders Canada, because at that time there was financial difficulties with uh, this patient's organization. So I think that it was uh, dismantled uh, during
in my term. So that was a bit of a challenge, but uh, still um, uh, having a good team around me, I think that we managed quite well. So I would say the meeting in Quebec City and probably something else. I'm not sure if we initiated that, but certainly that the fact sheets, uh, we were very active during my term in the writing up some of those fact sheets on insomnia and some other sleep and sleep disorders issues. Uh, so this was just the beginning before we had another meeting combined with the World Association of Sleep Medicine in 2011, but there was a, a gap in between and uh, so I was very pleased to bring back this meeting in Quebec City even after I was done with my presidency. Okay, thank you. Um I, I think I'm a bit of an outlier here and a bit of uh, representing a different stream. I spent most of my career, my name is Ben Rusak, by the way, and I'm a professor of psychiatry and psychology neuroscience at Dalhousie University. So I'm an outlier in the sense that everybody else around this circle is from either Ontario or, or Quebec. And while I grew up in Toronto, I, I don't admit that freely in most circumstances, and I've lived in Halifax for about 40 years, so I consider myself a Haligonian. The other way that I'm an outlier is that my uh, most of my career of research consisted of studies of biological rhythms and circadian systems in particular. And although I'd had an abiding interest in sleep in the background from the time I was a graduate student, I had never really pursued it as a research interest. And in fact, I think I may have been one of the first people to sign up for the CSS early on when it was founded, but I think I lapsed. <laughs> and I, th I think that was because 1986 was a hallmark year for me also because it was the year that I founded the Journal of Biological Rhythms and, and I was editor of that for 10 years. The year after that, uh, I helped Fred Turek get the Society for Research on Biological Rhythms get going. So I was very focused on sort of international things and very American focused and I think I let my, um, my focus on Canada lapse as well as my focus on sleep. Until Joe de Conic, I think he's the responsible party as past president, um, sent me an email saying that uh, he wanted to nominate me for VP research for the Canadian Sleep Society, which not only uh, pressed all my guilt buttons in terms of um, <laughs> whether I'd been paying my membership or not, which I couldn't remember. Um, so I promptly did, I believe, whoever was treasurer at the time. And, uh, and then I got a, a phone call or an email, I can't remember now what, where Joe said, congratulations, you've been elected. I wasn't even at the meeting, right? So I don't even know if there was an election or what. But one of my responsibilities as, as a VP research was to organize, in, ostensibly to organize the second meeting, which was held in Quebec City. And fortunately for me, we had Charles here and, um, uh, Céline Bastien and, and a whole team there who actually did all the work and I just got to sort of show up and enjoy it. It was great fun. Um, so I think what, one of the, the themes I, I just would like to put on the record is that um, despite the, the many different streams of you know clinical and basic science and technological and all those other things that had come into the formation and, and the growth of the Canadian Sleep Society, biological rhythmicity was never really part of it, even though from the very beginning of sleep research, going back to the late 19th century, the first sleep deprivation studies, everybody noted, the Kleitman did certainly years later, they noted the uh, phenomenon of daily rhythmicity and the effects of sleep loss, and yet it didn't make a big impact. And so I was, I saw it as part of my mission to try to bring the circadian and sleep research communities closer together. And we actually had funding from CIHR to have a meeting that some of you attended in Halifax in 2001, right around Christmas time, if I remember from the direct, from the decorations in the hotel, um, and uh, that was the the beginning of an attempt to, uh, uh, in fact, I should mention also, there were two meetings held very much at the same time. Uh, Frederick Siri held one meeting, I think it was in Toronto, at the same time with a similar funding source from CIHR. And we all reached the same conclusion, was that Canada needed a network that brought together sleep researchers from one end of the country to the other, not just as a society, but as a research enterprise and for educational purposes. And uh, uh, some 15 years later, we actually have one now, but it took 15 years of uh, argument and convincing to, in order for that to happen. So I'm very pleased to be able to see that, and I'm, I'm uh, honored to be able to sit at uh, the circle with uh, all these distinguished former presidents and current presidents. Dr. Driver, please tell us about your time on the uh, um, uh, CSS and uh, memorable moments. 
Thanks, Brian. My name is Helen Driver. I'm currently working at Kingston General Hospital and Queen's University. Um, I love the Canadian Sleep Society because of its multidisciplinary platform and the collegiality of people who are involved in the society. Um, well, before I even moved to Canada, which I came to Canada because I'd recognized the, the wealth of sleep expertise in the country and how many people I could learn from, I was a PhD student and went to an ESRS meeting in Denmark and met Roger Broughton. I still remember going for lunch and having a discussion about parasomnias. When I first moved, I was working with Colin Shapiro in Toronto, and at that time I thought, the best way to get to know more people was to volunteer to be involved in the society. Jamie McFarlane at the time was editor of Vigilance, so he was looking for someone to help out. So I said, sure, I'll be happy to help out. And uh, I remember going to the first meeting when Alistair McLean was there and Charlie George, and we talked about membership and recruiting members. And Charlie kept saying, this is not the Charlie Sleep Society. <laughs> and it was about how do we get people involved? But I have to say, once you get involved in the society, it is such a pleasure to get to meet and interact with different people. Um, I became VP Research and uh, then through the prompting of Charles and Gilles Levine, who's not here, got uh, coerced into maybe taking on the presidency. <laughs> I thought, one, I can't let the female population down because as a chance to showcase the strength of women in science, this was a good opportunity to do so. Also, you know, I don't want to let Charles and Jill down, neither the rest of the gang, knowing from Alistair and Joseph and Charlie. And I have to say, I remember the meeting in Ottawa, which was the first time I'd gone to one where patients were so involved. And it's really a pleasure. We've always had a plenary session where there's a patient lecture. And now to see that it's being brought back and even reinforced and intensified is lovely to see to keep it multidisciplinary. Um, the amount of work that goes into conferences is huge. After working with Shelley and Kimberly, <laughs> Kimberly and I put on the Toronto meeting in 2009. Then we worked with Jill. Uh, no, 2007 was the Montreal meeting. And then we went to Quebec City again for the Wasser meeting, which was a huge undertake, undertaking, and I think it really just showed, again, the interaction of Canada within the world stage and how many people were so happy to come to that meeting. Um, so it's been a pleasure for me to be involved and to work with so many <coughs> exciting, interesting, mm -hmm. friendly, collegial people. Dr. Weiss. So I'm Shelley Weiss. I'm a professor of neurology at the University of Toronto, and I'm a pediatric neurologist. So when you talk about the bylaws from uh, the 1980s, things have really changed. Uh, so I uh, was lucky to mention to Alistair that we needed a lawyer because we had to redo our bylaws. But the $237 you talked about would probably give us about five minutes of legal help in the 2010s. So uh, through Alistair, uh, one of the uh, uh, roles while I was the president was to uh, help redo the bylaws. And we had fantastic uh, help from the Queen's University Legal Clinic. The other thing that happened while I was a president that was very exciting was, you can correct me, this distinguished panel if I'm wrong, but I think 2013 is the first time we had the meeting outside of Ontario or Quebec. True? Mm -hmm. So uh, in 2013, with a great organizing committee, uh, Margaret Ryder and Ben Rusak and others, uh, we had our CSS meeting uh, in Halifax, and uh, we were a little bit nervous because uh, we... Uh, it, we depend on the meetings to help the society run, so that gives us our, uh, some of our income. And uh, we had a fantastic meeting in Halifax. We had about 450 people, uh, fantastic social activities, and uh, so it was a big success. And I think has stimulated more discussion about uh, our 
becoming more diverse and why we're actually going to have the next meeting in Calgary in 2017. So uh, that was excellent. Uh, the other thing that uh, we've done more recently is uh, think about education, which also became very important during the time I was a president because of changes at the American uh, sleep group, not letting Canadian uh, sleep physicians become accredited in any way. So one of the other big uh, activities, which continues to this day, is trying to get a diploma for clinicians who practice sleep medicine through the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada to be accredited. Uh, Dr. Cote, in the middle of your successful meeting, uh, please tell us about uh, your current experience and the future. It's nice to go uh, last in this exercise. It is really nice to hear everyone in that historical perspective because one of the things I'm very happy to say is uh, that so many of the, the values and the things that you've identified as being important are still so very important to the Canadian Sleep Society and, and the people on the board. I completely agree that the multidisciplinarity is what's unique about the Canadian Sleep Society relative to other types of societies uh, around the world in sleep, and, and I think it's its biggest strength. One of the things we did last year, which I can't take credit for because Helen Driver, always continuing to have an influence uh, on her way out, uh, as president, she's uh, actually, I guess you were past president at the time, but she was leaving the board for the first time in about 15 years. And she said to me, Kimberly, I really think what would be a great idea is if the society had a strategic planning exercise. We've never done this. So I took that torch and ran with it. And so that, that's, uh, I guess, what I have to report on so far is that we brought that to reality. And one of the things is that um, the initial goals from the uh, from the initial uh, organization of the group. We're still there in our bylaws, on our website, uh, five or six points about the goals of the Canadian Sleep Society. And of course, they were all still very valid, but uh, we hired a professional facilitator and uh, he said, you know, most uh, nonprofit organizations, they have a vision and a mission. And he sat us all down in a room for a full day at, to discuss our, our vision and mission. And it was really fascinating discussion and process. And what we came to uh, is that uh, the vision of the Canadian Sleep Society is healthy sleep for healthy Canadians. And the mission statement we came up with was uh, it really uh, takes all of those points from the original goals, but is, is uh, much more succinct. The Canadian Sleep Society is a national organization committed to improving sleep for all Canadians through support for research, promotion of high quality clinical care, education of professionals and the public, and advocacy for sleep and sleep disorders medicine. So that's where we sit today. And uh, what do you think the future holds? Um, as, as Shelley pointed out, um, something that's, uh, that a lot of us are working on right now in the board and in uh, ad hoc committees is, is education, formal educational opportunities, uh, CME credits for physicians, and uh, continuing education credits for technologists as well. But to bring that onto the, the platform of our website and offer more educational opportunities for people uh, through that. So we're sort of working to build that material right now, building a syllabus and, and, and moving forward with those plans. Okay, has the discussion today uh, brought any other last uh, minute points anyone wants to bring out? Dr. McLean? Well, just to add to some extent to what's already been said and partly as a result of uh, discussion earlier today with Carlisle and Charlie on either side of me, I think one of our concerns is to what extent education in sleep research and in clinical sleep matters is going to be embedded in the curricula in universities. And I think it was outlined by uh, the keynote address this morning by Elliot Phillipson. Many of us came into sleep in the 60s and 70s almost by chance and so built up around us sort of coteries of individuals who were uh, committed to education and sleep in the academic environment as well as in the general population. And I, I think I certainly have a concern, and I think a lot of my colleagues do, to what extent that is going to be upheld. I think in areas where one or two of us have been the people who have been leading sleep in our institutions and are now getting to the gray-haired stage, 
the question is, is that going to remain embedded in the institution? Because I think education in both the science of sleep, sleep for psychologists, respirologists, neurologists, general medicine, and so on, is really important to maintain. And I think we have a concern as to how that will be done. So one l more point? Yeah, it's really just following up on what was said. I know uh, when I retired from the University of Ottawa, we still only had one hour a, uh, a year for sleep physiology and sleep disorders for medical students at the undergraduate level. And I don't know whether this is similar in all other universities, but when you think of the epidemiology of sleep and the fact that sleep uh, is a third of your life and uh, good sleep is essential for good wakefulness. Uh, this is really short-sighted. The epidemiology shows that uh, uh, there's a very high percentage of the population that suffers some, from some sort of sleep disorders. So why, let's say, cardiology may have, uh, as an example, 15 or 20 hours, and sleep physiology and sleep medicine combined uh, at least in the University of Ottawa when I left, it was one hour, it is quite uh, short-sighted. So uh, thank you very much uh, to the founders of the uh, Society for your visionary efforts and for those who are carrying the torch on. Uh, thanks very much. Good night. The activities uh, that were organized uh, at APSS, which is the SRS and so on, and it was called the Snooze Ball. And uh, what I remember over the years is that the Canadian contribution to that was outstanding. And that usually it was a Canadian team that won, and Roger was part of it, and, and so on. I, I, I was on the first two winning teams. <laughs> I was Puckhead. <laughs> and we won. That's right. <laughs>